Thanks, sir. Um, most of this will finish at 15.45. Um, the um, these people and our partners at UCL Southampton will have a quick meeting after that. Um, we haven't put on a coach at 15.45, so you may want to either catch a lift, and there are, I think, a few people with cars, or there's a taxi number here which you might want to take down if you want to book yourself a cab, and it's 01420. 1420 87777. So that's 8477. I can give two people a lift. Okay. So you, you can all go, jump on Simon. <laughs> and you're right. um, so <coughs> I'm, I'm hoping that we can carry on today some of the, the really interesting discussions that we began to have yesterday. Um, and there will be, I hope, plenty of time for discussion both in the, in the panels but also inside the seminar and the, the half an hour or so session at the end where we'll try and sum up what we talked about and think about future projects. I mean, we'll all have a different sense, I imagine, of, of what some of the key ideas were that came out from, from yesterday. Just thinking about it in the last five minutes, I suppose. Um, two, 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 two sort of very general things that came out for me were the, the relationship between... Um, uh, sort of communities that interact with each other in the way communities do at the theatre and those, those images that, that David showed generating sort of heat and energy and then of these, uh, virtual communities and networks that we might see in, in the correspondence of Gilbert White or someone like that or, or Whitford to some extent so the relationship between those sort of the material interactions and the more virtual interactions um, and that might be quite an interesting way of you know, if one wants to think about it, a, a big project, something that would, 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 would combine that sort of data gathering about material interaction, but also be aware of the much more sort of conceptual and textual basis, something that combined the two, I think, would, would, would always be more interesting than one that was focused on one or the other. Um, I suppose... Oh, I've, lost, I've lost the other one. It was quite a good one as well. <laughs> 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 um, so, um, okay, I think that's enough, isn't it, <laughs> to, to start off with. So, as, as, as yesterday, I'm not going to do full introductions. Um, I'll allow Jane and Sarah to introduce themselves. Hello, I hope I've talked to most people, not Sarah yet. Uh, Jane Darcy, I'm a teaching fellow in the English branch of UCL, as I've probably told you. Um, I finished my PhD in 2009, and the only this year, or last year, sorry, 2013, did I finally publish my book on melancholy and literary biography. And after that rather sort of heavy and gloomy subject, I've turned both to a little project on Victorian comedy, but also to something I'd long cherished, which is looking at the Isle of Wight. I thought I was just going to do a Victorian period, with obviously with Tennyson, Julia Cameron, Annie Thackeray and so on. I thought, well, I'll write a little tiny bit about why the Isle of Wight started to become popular and I researched sea bathing and going for health reasons and picturesque travel and then thought I could probably write a tiny bit about Jane Austen but there was much more than I expected and I'm going to wow you today by proving that Jane Austen went to the Isle of Wight I bet you are intrigued <laughs> well um you'll remember that Fanny Price in Mansfield Park had a particular fondness for the Isle of Wight taken up by her wealthy relatives the Bertrams Fanny seems to her sophisticated cousins contemptibly provincial. But aunt, she's really so ignorant. Do you know we asked her last night which way she'd go to Ireland? And she said she'd cross to the Isle of Wight. She thinks nothing but the Isle of Wight. Calls it the island, as if there were no other islands in the world. I don't believe this reference was merely a matter of topographical accuracy. And in this paper, I'd like to sp explore evidence which suggests the Isle of Wight is a place of pleasurable resort had held a particular appeal to Austen, and this in turn shows something of the island's enormous popularity long before the notable arrivals of its most famous residents, Queen Victoria and Tennyson. And I'm going to whiz through one or two maps much, much earlier. Uh, people have various descriptions. That's fantastically inaccurate, but mostly it's lozenge <laughs> shape, or as a commentator in the 18th century said, it's shaped like a turbot. <laughs> From the later 18th century onwards, and I'm going to hold on that map, the Isle of Wight was attra uh, attracting two distinct types of visitor and resident. 
Firstly, artists who are unable to travel to Europe sought out the fabled picturesque beauty of this accessible and hospitable island. The Western Point had dramatic cliffs out, we can see the needles rather blurrily, um, with its much noted rocks, the needles. Then the long ridge of hill running east-west across its length offered unspoilt views of valleys, woods and the sea itself. But the most spectacular sight was of Spithead, and that's the body of water uh, between the island and Portsmouth, where naval vessels and merchant ships sailed or rowed at anchor. Most painters, however, favoured spots of rugged scenery and scenes of fishing boats braving storms. The first painting Turner ever exhibited, um, you can see the needles in the background, so Fisherman at Sea, 1796. From the 1790s onwards, writers published personal accounts of the picturesque qualities of the island in books often lavishly illustrated with etchings. The other type of visitor to the island was the one who sought health or recreation. Although spas continued to flourish throughout the 18th century and Regency period, coastal resorts began to take over in popularity. In anthropological terms, spas and resorts had a close connection. Just as one drank waters at Bath or Tunbridge Wells, regular sipping of seawater was ritualised and encouraged at seaside resorts for its therapeutic qualities. Sea bathing, of no more than a brief dip, held the same talismanic quality that had been attributed to bathing in hot spa waters. An entire seaside industry developed, concerned with supplying and operating of bathing machines and professional dippers to assist bathers. It would have been impossible to have been in the Navy during the Napoleonic Wars and been unaware of the Isle of Wight. It was clearly visible from Portsmouth, Southampton, I'll go back to that map, and all around the Hampshire coast. As a sailor, you might be aboard your ship at Spithead for weeks on end, waiting for a favourable wind, the island a mere rowing distance away, close enough to go on land for dinner. By the time Jane Austen was writing, the island had become home to a large number of naval men, taking lodgings there for their families while they were at sea and often settling there in retirement. The reverse was also true. To be on the Isle of Wight in the Napoleonic era was to be conscious of the proximity of war. Wordsworth spent a month walking there in 1793, having just fled France. The soothing effect of the sea was outweighed by the daily reminders of impending war. And you need that one. In the prelude, I beheld the vessels lie, a brood of gallant creatures. On the deep I saw them rest, in their rest, a sojourner through a whole month of calm and glassy days in that delightful island which protects their place of convocation. There I heard each evening, walking by the still seashore, a monetary sound which never failed, the sunset cannon. And in the end, distressed by this constant reminder of war, he flees, walks across Salisbury Plain to Tintern Abbey. Well, I originally thought Jane Austen herself had never actually visited the island, but I was wrong, and I found what I hope will be evidence that convinces you. From 1792, Jane Austen had reason to idealise the Isle of Wight. She spent much of her childhood, as you know, with her favourite older cousin, Jane Cooper, whose story became intimately bound to the island. Jane and Cassandra were sent away to school with Jane Cooper, and after the death of Jane's mother, Mrs. Cooper, she and her brother Edward spent Christmases at Steventon. In the summer of 1792, Jane Cooper, by then 20, went on a touring holiday with her father, brother, and the Lib Powisses, their relatives. Their original destination had been Cumberland, but like the gardeners in Pride and Prejudice, they had to alter their plans, the Reverend Cooper becoming too ill for a long journey. The Isle of Wight's climate and proximity made it the ideal destination. Caroline Lib Powers kept a journal, journal of this six-week tour. The party took a house in Ryde, and do I want to... Nope, we're going to keep on that one. So Ryde in the northeast corner, very small as you can see. And at the time it was little more than a village. Caroline reports in her journal, they were uniformly delighted by the island, describing jaunts in whiskies and strenuous walks, as well as trips to Portsmouth and to Spithead. These travellers were well informed about the principles of the picturesque. Caroline noting, I think the sea appears particularly fine at the island to what I recollect at other places, and there's no doubt because the land prospect is at the same time so fine, whereas in other places you seldom have woods or landscape to set off the noble views of the ocean. 
Three days into their stay at Ryde, Jane Cooper was introduced to a local naval captain, Thomas Williams. Williams had been in the Navy since boyhood and had already a successful career, promoted to lieutenant at 17 and winning prize money. Just as in persuasion, Captain Wentworth returns to shore, newly wealthy and ready to find a wife, Thomas Williams, aged 30, newly appointed to the command of a 28-gun frigate, was evidently keen to settle down. The couple swiftly become engaged and they were married from Jane Austen's house that December, thereafter returning to live on the Isle of Wight. I labour this romantic story to suggest that Jane Austen's view of the Isle of Wight must surely have been shaped by hearing countless times about this wonderful episode. Men of War. Part of Caroline Lib Powell's journal was subsequently published, but a significant section of it remains in manuscript. It's here that Caroline details the highlight of the trip, a guided tour of some of the huge naval vessels anchored off Spithead. She's conscious that her party are, at that moment, at the forefront of current events. We heard the news from India, she writes, before most people in London, as we saw the vessel come in with dispatches from Lord Cornwallis and Sir Hyde Parker happened to be with Lord Hood on board at the time. They were invited aboard Hyde Parker's 98-gun man of war, the Duke. Caroline was fascinated with the domestic details. Everything's so well contrived, she said, admiring the excellent use of space that allows 600 sailors to live on an airy and convenient middle deck with an additional 200 men and women, sorry, women and children on board until shortly before sailing. Slightly different from what I put up there. Jane Austen's knowledge of naval life must have begun with these first-hand observations, and we can hear echoes of Caroline's admiration for a ship's well-contrived spaces in Persuasion's portrait of Captain Harvel. At home, he had contrived excellent accommodations and fashioned very pretty shelves. He drew, he varnished, he carpentered, he glued, he made toys for the children, he fashioned new netting needles and pins with improvements, and if everything else was done, sat down to his large fishing net at one corner of the room. Now related by marriage, the Austins and Thomas Williams were to have a long life connection, a lifelong connection. Jane Austen's youngest brother, Charles, joined Williams' ship, HMS Daedalus, as a midshipman in 1794, moving with him to the Unicorn, on which in 1796 he took part in the capture of two French ships off the Scilly Isles, action for which Williams was knighted. When in 1797 Williams was given command of the brand new Endymion, Charles again served under him. This was the period in which Austen finished writing First Impressions and started Sense and Sensibility. But it's also when two family tragedies occurred. In April 1797, Cassandra lent of the death of her fiancé, a naval captain in the West Indies. And then in August 1798, Jane Cooper, now the 27-year-old Lady Williams, was killed in Newport on the Isle of Wight, her gig overturned by a runaway dray horse. And rather inappropriately, I'll just show you a pretty picture of Newport at the time when the river was less silted up than it is now. The fact we know nothing about Jane Austen's reaction to this tragedy is down to the absence of surviving letters from the period, but it must surely have inflected her feelings about the island. Deirdre Le Fay's Austin chronology makes it possible to trace regular trips to the Isle of Wight over the ensuing years made by Austin's extended family. Indeed, Austin's other naval brother, Frank, lived there after his marriage for ease of access to Spithead and Portsmouth. He stopped going to sea after the war ended in 1814 and was not to go on board again for 30 years but he and his growing family continued to visit the island, settling and ride for a long period for the birth of his 12th child in 1822. But did Jane Austen herself ever go to the Isle of Wight? There is an unsubstantiated tradition on the island that she visited in 1813. I think, however, there's enough circumstantial evidence to show she knew the island well and had stayed there long before 1813. Apart from the lure of visiting Frank and his new wife, there was the enduring appeal for Austin of the sea. We know that what sweetened the blow of her parents' sudden decision to move to Bath in 1801 was the plan to travel each summer. The prospect of spending future summers by the sea or in Wales is very delightful, she wrote. For a time, we shall now possess many of the advantages, which I've often thought of with envy in the wives of sailors or soldiers. We subsequently hear of their staying in various seaside resorts. And even refusing invitation to spend a summer in Shropshire, Jane Austen privately telling Cassandra 
For the present, we greatly prefer the sea to all our relations. But she was a discerning visitor. <laughs> she was a discerning visitor. Not all seaside resorts were the same. On one occasion, she writes to an acquaintance who talks of living at Ramsgate. Bad taste, she remarks, adding, he's very fond of the sea, however. Some taste in that. And some judgment, too, in fixing on Ramsgate as being by the sea. The main evidence that exists to show some of Jane's immediate family visited the Isle of Wight comes from two letters she wrote to her sister in 1808. Cassandra and her mother were staying on the island while Jane was at Godmersham in Kent. The implication of the letters is clear. The Austin family had been visiting the Isle of Wight long before this trip. Frank, who'd married in 1808, the same year, sorry, was away at sea, and Jane wrote to Cassandra, This scheme to the island is an admirable thing for his wife. And she writes of the greatest pleasure she feels from Cassandra's letter, and it picks up from here. Your account of your visitor's good journey, voyage and satisfaction and everything give me the greatest pleasure. They have nice weather for their introduction to the island, and I hope have a disposition to be pleased. Their general enjoyment is as certain as it will be just. This suggests more than a second-hand connection to the Isle of Wight. The warm, almost proprietary tone is evidence of its being a favourite place. This is reinforced subsequently when Jane cheerfully dismisses the reported reaction of their friend Martha. I do not at all regard Martha's disappointment in the island. She will like it better in the end. She clearly wants everyone to love the place as much as she does. The letter also provides evidence that Jane and Cassandra have been to ride. They have met and obviously kept in touch with old Mrs Williams, the elderly mother-in-law of their cousin Jane Cooper. And she puts, you're kind in mentioning old Mrs Williams so often. Poor creature. I cannot help hoping that each letter may tell of her sufferings being over. If she wants sugar, I should like to supply her with it. And I'll just give you a little slide of a photograph I took myself at the archive in Newport. Um, where they have a wonderful map. It's actually slightly later, it's 1817. But Bank Cottage, you can see on that right corner, is uh, that belonged to. Captain Williams and his mother. Um, it's that bit there. Oh, yeah. um, and you can see how tiny, at the end of that, it's just a road to nowhere. Um, so I was less surprised that Jane Cooper had met Thomas Williams as they were staying in Ride than that they hadn't met straight away because there were so few people to meet, really, in this tiny place. Um, Austin amuses herself comparing Cassandra's trip to the island with an epic journey made by Maria Hastings, wife of their famous cousin, Warren Hastings. He had fallen dangerously ill in India, and Maria had set off to nurse him, making the 400-mile voyage down the Ganges in three days. In gratitude, Warren Hastings had commissioned a painting, Mrs Hastings at the Rocks of Coulon. Cassandra's accounts of the Isle of Wight tickle her. I can't help thinking and rethinking of your going to the island so heroically puts me in mind of Mrs Hastings' voyage down the Ganges. And if we had but a room to retire into to eat our fruit, we'd have a picture of it hung there. But beyond all this, there's proof positive of Jane Austen having been to the Isle the Island. This is contained in a neglected fragment of her letter to Martha Lloyd, dated September the 2nd, 1814. And it is a tiny fragment, and its bits are missing. Writing from London... Jane tells Martha of a recent drive to Streatham, where she called on a certain Mrs Hill. And Austin includes a snippet of news. She told me the Audreys have taken that sweet St... And Deirdre Le Fay interpolates Boniface that we passed by something and Ventnor. And I'll come back to that, but just show you a later map, obviously, because you've got railways coming in now. But it's... Um, Ventnor would been absolutely nothing, and then it's down here under this dramatic hill, St Boniface down, and there's Ventnor and Bonchurch down there. It's a very pretty bit of the island. And it's where, in fact, the first slide of the modern one of the photograph of the red sand, that's which from there. And there's a little painting of Bonchurch as well, from 1799, same sort of period. St Boniface is the hill, the hill, the huge hill, above Bonchurch and Ventnor, on the south of the island, named after the saint who was said to have belatedly brought Christianity to the island. The we of the quote is interpolated by Deirdre Le Fay, although that sweet St Boniface that we passed by doesn't make complete sense. One of the missing words must surely be to a cottage or a house that the Audreys have taken. 
But it's clear that Austen is here talking about a particular part of the island of which, of which she and her sister are particularly fond. More than this, we're unlikely to find out, owing to the fragmentary nature of the remaining letters of Austen. But why does all this matter? Jane Austen, as we know, loved various seaside towns. What's the significance of her attachment to the Isle of Wight? I think it's, imp- it's part of evidence that the island held an important but hitherto unexplored place in the imagination of many in the Romantic period. And there were lots and lots of guidebooks, and I'm drawing your attention to the one on the left. I'm not actually at this moment talking about Gilpin, who went for three days and didn't rate it very much, but Hassel's tour from 1790 uh, was influential. So in 1790, John Hassel published a tour of the Isle of Wight, a guide which Caroline Lib Powers took on her tour two years later. As Hassel makes clear, the island's become extremely popular. He talks of parties of pleasure arriving there, along with those travelling for the benefit of their health, that now flock there on account of the purity of the air, the fertility of the soil, and the beauty and variety of the landscape. It has, he writes, justly earned its title, the Garden of England, applied to many places in the south, I think. But the island had long achieved such popularity. As early as 1768, the first guide to Southampton recommended the two-hour crossing to the Isle of Wight to those fond of sea excursions. The diversity of prospects they would find romantic and charming. By the second edition of 1775, the guide describes the island's most beautiful appearance, being next to Sicily, perhaps the most fruitful spot in Europe. And I'll be coming to rest on this from William Cook, a new picture of the Isle of Wight, which first came out in 1808. In the preface to A New Picture of the Isle of Wight, William Cook talks of travel as having now become one of the ruling passions of the people and universally prevalent, the desire for a change of scene within the limits of our native land. His summary of the reason for the island's popularity is particularly noteworthy. Amongst these, the Isle of Wight has long been framed and must ever continue to hold a distinguished rank. Its beauties are so celebrated as to attract the traveller of taste from every quarter. Its situation and climate so salubrious as to lure the invalid and votary of Hygieia. Add to which its position, in a military and commercial point of view, the station in its vicinity of a great part of the British Navy, the periodical rendezvous of outward bounding shipping to all parts of the globe, and lastly, the Grand Depot for recruits, whence the army is afterwards supplied. And I thought particular of interest was this final quote. Now, we have to take it with a pinch of salt, because William Cook is a, a local. Um, but I thought it's important to draw your attention to this. From all these causes, a greater influx of strangers is to be expected here than in any other part of the kingdom. And this succession of visitors continues in some degree throughout the year. So Cook's statement, even if he fails to substantiate it with any statistical evidence, tells us something very important indeed about the relative standing of the Isle of Wight in the Romantic period. By 1808, the writer can make the claim of its being the most popular holiday destination in Britain, by implication more popular even than the Lake District. And I hope by pointing to evidence of Jane Austen's association with the island, I've suggested something um, about its... As I say, it's significance which we haven't really looked at yet, and it's something that my larger project is looking in. So in conclusion, I think there's plentiful evidence the Isle of Wight held a special place in the imagination of the British, starting in the late 18th century, and that Jane Austen provides a key to understanding the island she referred to in persuasion as the far-famed Isle of Wight. And that is a picture, actually, of Freshwater Bay, for no good reason other than I was there. Thank you very much. Well, uh, my talk's going to be a little different, I think, as I'm, I'm actually an archivist rather than a researcher or, or um, historian. Um, my name's Sarah Lewin. I'm a principal archivist at the Hampshire Archives and Local Studies. And I've been there for over it's nearly 29 years now. So, um, so I've got quite a detailed knowledge of the collections that we hold at Hampshire. I manage the, collect- the, the cataloguing programme there. And I give local history lectures and been involved in uh, publication programmes at the record office. But also, each year, I give induction sessions to MA and PhD students 
about the resources we hold, the archives we hold, and how they might be used in research. And that's how I came to know Emma. So I'm someone with a, a knowledge of local archives, what local archives are, and how they might be used in a wide range of research, really from the medieval period right up to the modern day. So my paper is going to present a rather different perspective, I think, but I hope it's appropriate for this. What I propose to do is take three writers from the late 18th, early 19th century, and coincidentally, the ones I've chosen are the ones from three around Farnham, which is a complete, complete coincidence, but they all have a strong Hampshire connection. And I'm going to... Um, they're most, those are writers who are most known through their published writings, I would say, and perhaps their letters, their correspondence with others. They're Jane Austen, Gilbert White and William Cobbett. And what I'm going to do is show or ask what local archive sources, the sort of bread and butter of county record offices, those sorts of sources, can tell us about their lives, perhaps their creative communities, their networks, but possibly also more likely, in fact, the communities in which they live, their social networks, um, their local, their local sort of um, social and um, parish networks, and to see whether this is a helpful approach to understanding their work or aspects of their work. So the sources I'm going to refer to aren't necessarily going to provide substantial new insights into their life and work, but what they will be able to do is to allow us to see them in a local context as part of their local community with the family, their social and wider networks, perhaps the parish and parish or trade and commerce. Occasionally in a local archive setting, we will be lucky and actually have resources which show the creative networks that they're involved in. And we've got a wonderful example, which I'm not going to talk about today, which are the papers of James Harris, the father of the first Earl of Malmesbury and he knew Jennings and Handel and we have a substantial correspondence which shows in the mid 18th century the sort of cultural networks that he had and they've, those papers have been explored quite thoroughly now what I'm going to get, say is not earth shatteringly original but it, and it may well be very familiar ground to you all so I apologise if I'm sort of t telling you stuff you know already um, and I'm not an expert in the writers I've chosen, but I do know stuff about local archives, so that's the perspective I'm, I'm coming at. Another interesting question is the lack of sources, because often it's very lucky what has survived and what hasn't for the 18th and 19th centuries. So it's very much sort of glimpses we'll be getting because of the fortunate survival of some archives, and it's not something that's comprehensive. So it's a little bit sort of serendipitous, a bit tangential. I'm going to sort of come at these people in a rather, in almost a sort of random way and see what the local archives tell, tell us about them. Just a tiny bit of background about local record offices, which I hope you're all familiar with. Um, there's absolute treasure houses of, of material. We, I mean, Hampshire, we have stuff dating back to 1155, right up to the present day. They're either at county level or at city or borough level. There is a complete network of them across the United Kingdom. Um, they've been really sort of going since post-Second World War. And you ought, if you're interested in the sort of thing I'm talking about, you all ought to get familiar with the National Archives website and two particular bits of it, ARCON, are you aware of ARCON? And the National Register of Archives. Go into the National Archives website. If you're interested in a family, um, an organisation, they pull together information from local record offices all over the country. So say, I mean, an example from Hampshire, we have some papers of the Dukes of Bedford, the Russell family, but actually they're all over the country because they had lands everywhere. So if you're thinking of some of your figures that you study and you want to know where the archives are, because the gentry and the aristocracy, for example, were landowners all over the place. I mean, a really good example is this family here, the Knights of Chawton, Kent and Hampshire. So you must, 
use Archon, which gives you details of record offices, and then the links into the thing called the National Register of Archives. And that will sort of open doors for you in terms of local archive research. Um, we all, all local archives, do the same basic thing. We collect archives in, um, sometimes proactively, sometimes we just are reactive and think, wow, this stuff is still coming. And we catalogue it and we make it available for research. So we have these two aims, and everyone will say that. And local archives essentially have the same sorts of material. So it will be sort of local government and uh, public records, so the county, boroughs, parish. We'll have records of schools, hospitals, prisons. So that sort of public aspect of life. We'll also have records of the Church of England, the diocese and the parishes, the ecclesiastical parishes. And then a huge category which we call other, <laughs> which is the family, the private archives, which is often where the best bits are. Um, but that also might be businesses, charities, local voluntary groups and organisations, um, non-conformist churches, um, sort of, as, w as, as well. And estates and families, I mean, uh, that's one of the largest categories that you'll find in any record office. And that can be stuff about estate management, about the land, but it also can include personal archives, diaries, correspondence, and political and public rec um, correspondence and diaries or whatever relating to individuals so often a very fruitful place for research um, so that's the sort of background to what I'm going to talk about um, and I'm, I'm glad that some people haven't heard of Archon and NRA and that perhaps I can tell you something that might be be useful to you so the three figures I'm going to talk about are Jane Austen um, Gilbert White and William Cobbett and obviously as a little sort of warm-up I've got this uh, engraving of Chawton House from Prosser's Views, 1833. He did a lovely collection of views of Hampshire country houses. And in fact, you'll know, if, you're, if you know about Jane Austen, that she knew, was connected, the Austens were connected with all sorts of gentry and aristocracy, aristocratic families. And I could actually do a slideshow of all the country houses she visited from this Prosser's Views, if that was of interest to you, but I won't do that today. So she spent almost all her life in Hampshire, as you'll know, apart from the Bath years. Steventon, then Southampton, well, Steventon, then Bath, then Southampton, and then to here in Chawton from 1809, and then to her death in Winchester in 1817. And as we know, she's known principally through her writings and her letters, particularly the letters to Cassandra. And so much has been written about her. And local sources have already been hugely exploited. Dietrich Le Fay has been to the record office a lot and has done a lot of work there. So I was thinking, can we find out more? Are there new bits uh, of information we can get about Jane Austen and her connection to the county? And sometimes it's a little prosaic what we find. I've looked more widely than just Jane Austen as well. I've looked at her family and the, and her father's brothers, her father and brothers, and that sort of thing. So the first thing that struck me was that she really comes from a community of clergy. There's a clergy sort of link. And in the record office, we hold records of clergy appointments throughout the Winchester Diocese from the 18th, well, from the Middle Ages, in fact. And so I was thinking, well, she has a clergyman father. Can we find out stuff about him? And again, it's, it's really just appointments so we can just confirm the dates of appointment the offices he held in the church and this shows him being presented to Steventon in 1761 and it's by his cousin Thomas Knight and so we see that important link that important Knight family link um, and he'll be recorded in the bishop's register as well and on the right hand side you see his appointment his institution to Steventon in 1761. So it's rather dry, but it does give you the dates. Then I started to think about Jane Austen as the clergyman's daughter, growing up in Steventon and popping up in the parish records. She, was, she, was, she lived in a village. She would have known the people in the village. She was christened with other people in the village in 1775, actually privately baptised. I'm not sure, does that perhaps mean she wasn't very well? And so they baptised her 
privately initially, and then there was a, received into the church a little later in April 1776. But she's listed there, along with some of her brothers and Cassandra, in the local Stevenson baptism register. As she grows up, she actually starts appearing in the marriage register as well, as a witness to two uh, marriages in Steventon. So we see Cassandra and Jane both witnessing a marriage in 1792. So I like to sort of imagine this, the, the, the daughter of the clergyman attending church and, and witnessing a marriage. She also, we understand, had a playful side to her because at some point she gets hold of her father's marriage register at Steventon and uses the specimen entry pages at the front of the register to invent a publication of bands and a marriage for herself um, with um, Henry Frederick uh, Fitzwilliam of London and then Edmund Arthur William Mortimer of Liverpool. So, it, I mean, some people say, is it really Jane Austen's hand? And I'll leave others to, to make that you know, judgment. But the story is that she somehow was doodling in her father's parish register. Then I was thinking about the, the Austens at home in Steventon and what do we know about that and do the, can the local archive sources we hold shed any light on that? And we've got this amazing survival from Basingstoke in the late 18th century, which are the... Um, sorry, my notes about this. They're a customer accounts ledger for furniture and furnishings supplied by John Ring, auctioneer and furnisher of Basingstoke. And they survive from 1785 to 1796 in two vast leather-bound volumes. And John Ring basically cornered the market in Basingstoke for all the gentry and aristocratic and clergy families and was selling them um, fab fabrics, furnishings. Um, and we have these ledgers, ledgers with the name of the customer at the top of the page. And the Reverend George Austin appears on one, two, three, four, five, six, about 10 or 12 pages of this volume. So you could actually, by close study, find out what he was doing in his house at Steventon. So this first page, 1794, it's a lot about fabric um, and carrying the fabric to Steventon. The second page, we have the purchase of a small mahogany writing desk with... Uh, drawers and glass inkstand complete so it's a fanciful sort of assumption to think perhaps, perhaps Jane Austen wrote at this writing table but whatever we're seeing a house being furnished at Steventon um, and what is also very exciting about this account ledger is it gives um, the names of customers all over the Basingstoke area who were in the Austen world people who crop up in Jane's letters in the Austin Lee diary which will, um, the, sorry, the shoot, Eliza Shute diary which we're going to look at in a moment. So she, her family, along with many other families in the Basingstoke area, is coming to rings in Basingstoke and buying furniture and furnishings. I was then thinking about the wider world of her brothers and James Austin was vicar of Sherburn St John and then took over from his father at Steventon after his father's death and we have his appointment records slightly dull again Henry Thomas Austin is another matter though he comes to the church rather later in life I don't know how much you know about his, his, his life story I knew nothing about it till I came across his ordination papers dated 1816 where they're much fuller than most ordination papers, as he actually writes a foresight letter to the Bishop of Winchester, Lord North, explaining um, why he's entering holy orders at a more advanced stage of life than is for the most part usual. And he provides basically an account of his life up to that point with its ups and downs. He'd um, wanted to go to the, into the church originally but because of the political circumstances of the time, it was 1793 he'd had to join the militia and so he accepted a commission in the Oxfordshire militia and then he followed a career in banking so I think some of you will know that you know, Thomas Austin was, Henry Thomas Austin was in banking but the bank went bankrupt 
He says, I was not unsuccessful till rendered so by the conduct of those gentlemen who unfortunately for me were my partners in the bank at Alton. Their mismanagement of that concern obliged me to close all my other concerns. And then he, he's obviously worried at, that this past would harm his reputation. So he says, conscious of no criminality, I state my worldly failure without hesitation. I bow most humbly to the stroke of providence and am rendered thereby, thereby more desirous than ever of devoting the rest of my life and talents, such as they may be, to the more immediate service of religion. So Jane's favourite brother, the, the man who helped her so much in the publication of her novels, we learn a little bit about his background, just from an ostensibly rather dull-looking bundle of papers in the bishop's, in the bishop's archive. And then I was thinking, do these... These clergy networks, do they mean that the Austin men move more widely in Hampshire circles among other Hampshire clergy? And I was doing a project on education in Hampshire in the early 19th century and came across this um, book of subscriptions to the Hampshire Society for the Education of the Infant Poor, which was the Hampshire branch of the National Society set up in 1811. And among the subscribers is... Miss Reverend James Austin, Rector of Steventon, and he wants to be his mail to be directed to Serban, Sherban St John in Basingstoke because he was vicar there as well, and he's paid a subscription of one pound, one shilling, and he wants it directed to the school at Overton for some reason, um, if any there, if there's one set up, he wants that money to go to Overton. So, but the the cast list in this subscription book. Um, most about 50% are, are local clergy, and one likes to think it's you know there's this community of clergy in Hampshire who are all sort of thinking about the importance of education for the poor. But it's also we have Right Honourable Lord Bolton, one of the main me members of the aristocracy who lived down the road at Hackwood, just south of Basingstoke, and also Sir Thomas Baring of the Baring family. So it's giving you an, a window into the sort of gentry and aristocratic and clergy networks in Hampshire at the time. The Austin family, as I've, as I've just hinted, was part of a community of the gentry and of the local aristocracy. The Austins were obviously connected to the Knight family from Chawton, um, and obviously Jane's brother um, is adopted by the Knights and becomes Edward Knight. He took the name of Knight. James, as I've mentioned, was vicar of Sherburne St. John, and he dined regularly with William Shute of the Vine, which was in Sherburne St. John Parish. And they came to know Eliza Shute, <coughs> who William married in 1793. And we have a series of pocketbook diaries of Eliza Shute, of which this is an example, from 1790 up until the 1840s. And they um, record briefly, but sometimes revealingly, her network, Eliza Shute's network of friends and acquaintances in the Basingstoke area. And this is a page from 1793, about a month after her marriage. And in the middle we have the vine. Visited Miss Biggs. Well, I'm not sure if you're, if you're aware, but the Biggs are friends of the Austins. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Lefroy are out. Mr., Mrs. and Miss Austins dined and supped at Miss, Mrs. Bramston's, met Mr. Mrs. Beach there, played at Snip Snap and <laughs> stayed till 11. And then she goes, uh, Mr. C hunted, he's always hunting, William Shute is always hunting, and dined at the Basingstoke Club. We went to the ball there. Mr. and Mrs. Bramston, Mr. and Mrs. Beach returned home, blah, blah, blah. Jane Austen isn't mentioned at that particular ball, but as we know, she went to many balls. So these journals, these sweet little pocketbooks, could be looked at in detail to give a picture of the network, the social network that Jane Austen and her friends moved in. And so a very valuable resource. Um, yes, they, Claire Tomlin quoted from one or two of them in her Jane Austen biography. So... 
uh, Deirdre Le Fay, in her um, work on Jane Austen, referred to the quantity and the quality of the society with whom the Austens mixed in the Steventon neighbourhood at Basingstoke assemblies or the private balls. And we at the record office have a large number of family and estate collections relating to the families that she mentions. The Dukes of Bolton, Knight family of Chawton, the Earls of Portsmouth, the Mild Maze of Dognesfield, the Portals of Free Folk, the Jervis of Herriard family, and the Hethcotts of Hursley. This is just an example of a map of Lord Bolton's estate, um, but it's actually bits that he owned in Basingstoke, so that's the market house in Basingstoke. And this is from a beautiful atlas of um, Chawton uh, from the Knight family, 1771, showing um, their lands, and there's a, a milkmaid and a a swain under a tree with a cow. Um, one of the families I just mentioned, did I mention the Hethcotts of Hursley? Um, just, I was thinking, searching on our online catalogue to see what comes up under Austin. And um, this is a letter from a young William Hethcote to a cousin talking about um, uh, merrymaking at Steventon, which Mr Digweed gave to his haymakers. There were donkey races, mainly for the sport. Old women to wheel barrows blindfolded for two blue ribbon bows. Young women to run a race, and it goes on. I um, got a donkey lent me to run. The one I used to ride, Edward Austin, was my jockey. <laughs> and this is James Austin's son, Edward. Um, so uh, we have a detailed view of sort of merrymaking um, given for haymakers but at which the local gentry attended with games just, it just was alluded to in our catalogue and I did a sort of search on the name Austin and this popped up, I'd never seen it before preparing for this talk so um, we get a view into her world really I'm now going to swiftly move on to Gilbert White um, we're moving down from Chawton down the map a little way to Farringdon and Selborne. Yes, um, there's Selborne. Like Jane, he lived most of his life in Hampshire, 1720 to 1793. He was a naturalist, obviously a naturalist, and he's most well known as the author of the Natural History of Selborne. Um, he was educated at Oxford and ordained into the church. And he served in the church never as a vicar or rector, but always as a curate at Swarton and Bradley in Hampshire, Farringdon and Selborne. Um, and so he does appear in some official records. Oh, that's just a, a view from the frontispiece from the first edition of the Natural History of Selborne. So he appears in the official record. These are his ordination papers. Interestingly, in his testimonial... It's mostly fellows of Oriel who give him testimonials rather than local clergy. He doesn't seem to have moved in the sort of clergy, gentry networks that perhaps the Austin clergy did. Um, so I sort of, I'm quite interested by the fact that his appointments don't appear in the official record. It might be because the diocesan record keeping was poor at that point. Or it might be because his appointments were sort of unofficial. Um, he was sort of slipping in under the radar as an unlicensed curate, um, doing favours for local clergy. Um, and so that could be looked at a little more to work out why he was taking these appointments, because they were sort of a bit sporadic, mainly at Farringdon and Selborne. So White's principally obviously known as a pioneer in natural history writing, focusing on the importance of local natural history, with close, detailed observation on the flora and fauna, and with an interest in Selborne's history and antiquity. And his natural history was published, obviously, his letters to Pennington and Barrington. Um, but um, among the archives at Hampshire Archives, we have two very different kinds of sources in his hand, <coughs> both which show his meticulous recording and eye for detail, but they're in a different vein, and they show his involvement with local, the local community and its people. Um, interestingly, I was looking at Maybe's introduction to the history of Selborne, and um, he sort of comments that 
he's been often criticised for the lack of attention he pays in the book to his human parishioners. Um, and he says there's no suggestion of malice here or even of aloofness. By all accounts, White was a sociable and easygoing man and much liked by his parishioners. I think it's simply that although he brought the natural world closer to the human, he did not take the next step and see that ordinary human affairs were in part their part, their turn part of the natural scheme of things. And I thought that was quite an interesting point in, in, in view of what I'm going to show you. So we've got two sources, main sources, in White's hand in the record office. One is his accounts, his domestic accounts. So we have his account books while living at Selborne from 1758 to um, 1765. And then the tiny bundles of receipted bills that he's meticulously folded and labelled on the outside between 1787 and 1793, which show really his purchases and his links with local tradesmen um, and labourers that he was paying. So this is an example of his housekeeping accounts. Um, very neatly kept, um, some reference to some people, um, showing, but most interesting perhaps for his, the material world that they shed light on what he was buying and consuming and just factual sort of bought of so-and-so. So we don't get any much impression of his interactions with individuals. The other source we have are the parish registers that he met meticulously maintained as curate. And again, I think this is quite interesting because to me, these are, again, meticulously observed, but um, it show this attention to factual detail about people rather than animals in that rare among the clergy of this date he was actually recording ages of the deceased and sometimes the circumstances of death if it struck him as interesting and this is not common normally at this date clergy are just recording dates of burial and um, who they were names and dates of burial so we have a young woman in the middle a young woman a vagabond, a vagabond who died in a barn was buried November the 1st 1768 she was found stark naked. So there's a sort of, an interested, he's interested in the ex extraordinary, which is in a way what he's doing with his nature notes as well. And the age, recording of age, um, is also something that, you know, as I said, it's not common at that date. Um, five, minutes or five, that's great, good. And the other, I've just, this is a page, just again, showing his, um, his recording of marriages which, um, again, is meticulous, and what every clergyman would do. Um, so I, try, I suppose what I was trying to think about is how, um, wh what is the person thinking when he's writing this? What is he making of his parishioners? Is he just doing it as a sort of routine chore? Or is there actually, and you can't tell from this, but what you do know is that he is interacting with his parishioners he has to be there at burials, he has to be there at weddings. So that's quite an interesting question. Um, the, the, the sort of fact that maybe says you don't really get much idea of his interaction with people, but he was doing it on a daily basis as a clergyman. So it's a, an unanswered question, but um, at least we see that this was happening. Um, the last person I'm going to look at is William Cobbett, the political writer obviously known for the political register, rural rides, and many other works. And he's a campaigner for parliamentary reform with a particular concern for rural e England and the economic hardship of farm workers. Less well known is that between 1805 and 1817, Botley in Hampshire was his primary residence. And he was in deeply involved in Hampshire rural society and the daily routine of farming. His letters and writings tell us much about his Hampshire years, but the local sources we hold can add significantly to our knowledge of his role in the local community, particularly in parish life, um, and his relationships with fellow parishioners um, and local clergy. Um, local newspapers are one good source. I, I should have mentioned, actually, that's a good source for Jane Austen's work as well, knowing when the balls were happening and this sort of thing. But um, local newspapers um, are a, a very good source for some of Cobbett's interconnection with, with Hampshire, um, Hampshire people. Um, and also parish records. And what I'm going to do is foc focus on one particular source, which are the Bishop's Waltham Vestry Minutes, 
to see how William Cobbett, the parishioner, emerges, the active parishioner. Um, he um, get, he's very, gets very aggravated by things, and he's always <laughs> uh, taking... Well, the, the aggravation really comes across in his writings, um, that the, the parish records give us more of the idea of what he was... Um, the actual, the real man attending a meeting or signing a document as part of the parish world, the, the Bishop's Waltham world. So um, he uh, constructed a turnpike in 1809 to help him get to local market towns more quickly. And um, the upkeep of the road fell on the parishes of Bishop's Waltham, Droxford and Titchfield, and they appointed highway surveyors which were to sort of maintain these. When he came out of Newgate Prison in 1812, he was very heavily in debt and his estate was run down and his part of the road was in decay and he wanted to get some redress. So he, um, took, he summoned the parishes of Bishop's Waltham, Droxford and Titchfield to court um, for failing to repair his road. And this is an entry from Bishop's Waltham Vestry Minutes from 1813, um, where we have present William Cobbett, um, Mr. Steele, Mr. Gunner, Mr. Wyatt, and Mr. Veck. And he, it's a meeting to take into consideration an indictment um, laid on a certain road or roads within this parish by William Cobbett. And reference to this indictment props up over and over again in, in the Vestry Minute book. And we actually published um, a Hampshire paper at the Record Office on Cobbett in Hampshire. And the author, Barbara Bedell, um, did quite a lot of work on this case. So there's more in, in that paper. Um, and we have a map in the Record Office um, which actually shows um, the roads in question. And we see blazoned across the middle the estates of Mr William Cobbett. Or William Cobbett, that's one of his farms at Fairthorne. And that's his house. Um, which I showed you the print of at the start. Um, he um, had a sort of conflicting, conflicted relationship with sort of the concept of poverty and you know, whether people should be helped or should look after themselves. And um, he was on the actually served on a committee <coughs> for new um, for Bishop's Waltham, a vestry committee about the setting up of a new parish workhouse. And the workhouse appeared in um, 1808. Um, and the idea was that it accommodated the aged and young children. But when children were considered capable of going out to work, um, they were balloted out at a vestry meeting and parishioners had to take on a pauper to, as, a, as a, a worker on their farm. And we see here in 1816, William Cobbett, is, um, has to take on Jane Collins, age 10. And he's pretty annoyed about this as well. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote bitterly, apparently, that these young paupers must be kept clothed, fed, lodged and doctored until they grow up to be men and women. He reckoned he already supported 28 paupers and Jane was an extra burden he did not deserve. And apparently he wrote as if she'd lived on for years with them, but she, she was there less than a year because he then went <laughs> off to America. So he makes a big deal of it. So he's, he's quite an interesting character, really, in terms of you know, what he said and what he actually did for himself. He wasn't renowned for paying his own labourers very many wages, um, very much in wages. Um, and the last entry um, is to do with Cobbett's relationship to the church. Um, he really objected to paying tithes, as you may well know, and there was a rector at Bockley called Richard Baker, who he fulminates against for the tithes he, he levied. And actually, interestingly, in our church court papers, there are several cases where Baker is taking his parishioners to church court for non-payment of tithes. So perhaps Cobbett had a point, perhaps this Baker was particularly um, keen to get every last penny from his parishioners. So, you know, a difficult relationship with the church, but apparently he did admire the rector of Bishop's Waltham, James Ogle. And this, again, is from the Vestry Minute Book for Bishop's Waltham. And um, there had been, on the previous page, um, uh, the, the, the 
rector had suggested that um, a different order of service times should happen and that they should stop having weekly prayers on a Wednesday or Friday and just have them in the afternoon on a Sunday. And um, on the preceding page, there are loads of signatures against that idea. And then on the, the following page, we have, in support of the idea of the changes, James Ogle, the rector, Charles Walters, the curate, and the third signature, signature is William Cobbett saying, yeah, I, I support the vicar, the, the rector in this case. So he's, you know, very interesting relationship with the clergy. It depended on who it was and what they were doing. So that's my final example. Um, in, I suppose in conclusion, these aren't earth-shattering revelations about the people, but what I wanted to show is that there's a wealth of local material in record offices that can give you sort of interesting new lights on people or suggest avenues for a search that you may not have considered. The sources may not always survive. It's, you know, they can be very gappy. Um, but where they do survive, they can give you some quite new insights and new ways of looking at individuals and, and the worlds in which they lived. Thank you. I mean, this, this is Mac Manor for you, Sarah. I, mean, I haven't really done much of that sort, very little of that sort of archival work. And I suppose one reason is my, my laziness. The other is um, perhaps a, a foolish assumption on my part that, 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 that so much sort of biographical work has been done on, on the figures I'm interested in. The, the offices have been sort of scoured by much more studious scholars than me. I mean, is that a, is that a a foolish assumption. To I, I think, not a foolish assumption, but sometimes things come to light all the time. Um, ca more detailed cataloguing is done, which brings things to light. And I think perhaps sometimes in the past scholars haven't necessarily delved as deeply. I mean, I, I don't think in the first um, Deirdre de Fay work, I don't, not on the family record. I don't think she referred to that diocesan letter of Henry Thomas Austin's where he's talking about his career. I'm not sure that that was very widely known. So, that, that, as I say, they're not huge pieces of information, but there may be, um, there may be things one can do with them. Um, it's the idea of looking at a source and seeing, seeing what, what it can tell you and where it can go. I mean, that, the ring, the auctioneer's um, account book, someone could do something quite interesting on consumption with that. But also the, the sort of um, uh, the references to the Austin family, you know, they just spring out and you can sort of get a picture that, that I don't know if it's been interesting because I, I, you know, I don't know all the research that goes on. So I would always, um, you, you, I suppose, look at bibliographies and see whether a particular archive is mentioned, but stuff does come to light all the time. Um, We've had a re quite recent accession of letters of Madame Lefroy, Jane Austen's, you know, confidant, and um, letters from the um, Wither family of Oakley Hall, which I think was another con contact. So it's always worth trying, and I would use the Archon. Um, well, as you say now, that um, things are much more electronic. Mm. It allows them a sort of second wave of scouring through absolutely, the Archon. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Thanks for that, Alan. I would just follow up on David's question. I suppose, would it be true in your experience that most literary scholars, rather than social historians, actually are simply doing that virtual, uh, sorry, that vertical thing of looking for anything to do with that author, rather than looking laterally? I mean, so even missing out, I mean, I, I thought that's the point you made about, um, um, about the, the, the register of deaths, as it were. Mm. Um, Right, I thought was was fascinating. But, but you've got that ability to say, and that's that's really unusual. That is categorically different in that period to anyone else who's making. And it's that lateral move, rather than just looking for Gilbert White. It's actually seeing Gilbert White in that lateral move mm. and being able to make that kind of comparison that I think is useful for the, this kind of interest that we've got in 
in community. I, I think I think that I think it helps to know about archive sources and the sorts of information they'll tell you, which is where the archivist can come in because that's yeah. our training is to sort of understand the sorts of records you're likely to find yeah. and the sorts of information they'll have. So I think the lateral. The lateral thing is really quite exciting because yeah. it can take you on, on journeys that you're not really expecting. Um, so, and I think you're probably right. I think people do probably look for a name in an index and stick with that. And perhaps it's worth talking to an archivist when you, when you arrive just to say, or, or doing it for yourself, really, thinking, well, my figure was a clergyman. Uh, what he would have been in a parish. Can I? I'll go and look at the parish records and see what they tell me. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to ask Jane. I suppose what it brings, what your people mm. brings out, is that Jane Austen is nearer the war front uh, because of uh, the, the, the Isle of Wight is also the front line against the, the French, and you know in that uh, thing that you sh- show for eighteen oh eight, the the diary, because mm. all the, the East India company ships used to go, I think, uh, yes. gather at the Isle of Wight to be escorted round the channel and, and the French coast on the way on around the to, convoys, to, yes. to, to India. So all those ships had to congregate <coughs> there. Um, you know, the warships were, were there. Sh- so they, you know, that, that area must have been absolutely flocked, with, not only with the fleet, but with East India Company convoys. Go, yes. going out there so There's been very lots of stuff about um, well I was thinking on a different one but when um, Nelson's body is brought back um, the, his, the victory stays rides on the water outside ride before they're ready to oh. take his body yeah. up the Thames for the, the funeral mm. and I think you'd be so much at the forefront I and mean, I've looked at lots of paintings of where well, you're just looking out at these ships at Spithead mm. and there's a record of a um, a panorama that's made and then displayed in London, and Jane Austen makes reference to going to see this, mm. where they take, they're looking across from Portsmouth, cross Spithead to Isle of Wight and all these ships. So it must have been, you must have been so aware of it, and I felt mm. that with Wordsworth, you know, mm. both the glamour of it and the, the fact that you're at the forefront of war. Yeah, and, and it's 1803 that you get that huge invasion scare. There mm. are mm. these, you know, broadsides saying, you know, attack the enemy, attack the enemy, mm. you know, if they... If they Land so that that idea, you know, the, the possibility of an invasion was, was very was real. Was around. She's she's going on holiday. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. And, and that, was, it, was it fortified at all? Oh yes. Oh, I should have said. I mean, Henry the Eighth's time. Martello there are Martello towers and the okay. the big. I mean, Carisbrook is one, but the one at Yarmouth as a castle, and it was all fortified by Henry the Eighth. And there are wonderful pictures of the Spanish Armada all sort of you know, Henry right VIII, outside. But not in the period. Not in the period. I think it was luckily it was very difficult to land on on the south coast. So there were lots and lots of shipwrecks. So um, it wasn't. A, I'm not absolutely sure. I think there was another invasion scare in the 1780s. In fact, talking to an archivist there about mm. that. Mm. The, I, I was thinking in 18, between 1805 and 1809, Jane Austen was actually living in Southampton, mm. so that was even more immediate. I mean, she's yes, right I mean, up against right, the yes. coast. And um, from another a written account I know of um, someone who grew up in in on, on the east shore of um, Southampton, she recalls as a child going to the camps and seeing encampments on Netley Common and being scared by her governess about Boney will get you. Mm. And, and so that was very, that threat that was very real along the coast to that fear. So um, you're, you're right about, about that. But the South, you know, being actually living in Southampton make, make, makes it even more scary. And actually in the, the, record, the Hampshire record office, mm. I found very, was the guidebooks, of course. So Southampton just saying, you know, it's, it just, even in this later 18th century, that it was oh, this mere two hours across. Yes, you know, she, it may be that you can't have lived there and not popped over to see it. Um, um, I was curious about that agonising missing image. Yes. <laughs> yes. um, I just wanted to say a bit more about the material conditions of it. I mean, I, I totally buy your argument based on the June 1808 mm. letters mm. that proprietary as well. 
makes a point it has been there. But what's going on with that manuscript? Is there a plot of I mean, I want to follow up on it. It's in a private collection, annoyingly, in the state. So I do want to see it just in case there's something that... Um, but it just, I say, I mean, it's, it's partly dear to Faye, and I must correspond with her again on this, because she'd been helpful about other questions about archives. But it did seem to be... I mean, I say it's based on so little, but um, there's something about the we passed at, and it's those two places. So, um, But I say it is, it is flimsy, but at least it was... Um, and I'm dying to see it, but it's a matter of whether I can... Going through Dear Le Fay's, you know, absolutely, incredibly methodical chronology can also... And her letters, um, because she's reissued the, a new edition of Jane Austen's letters, 2011. And actually, there were, no, there were no new ones found from the 1995. So, sort of, I'm reassured that there's going to be a new evidence that I've missed. But I would like to see that scrap, just in case there was anything that... Uh, revealed because I was obviously start off just using indexes and thought well I went to the obvious references to cows but like this little tiny scrap of vent norm only came when I read solidly through every single letter and thought oh actually I know Will had a question yeah. um, I was just interested in talking about the crossing Jane mm. um, because obviously people weren't crossing to France in anything like the numbers that they were beforehand mm. or, or afterwards and I'm really interested in what people say on their crossing mm. to, to Europe so you, know, you either get people that are just playing on seasick, and they're the ones I kind of like, who kind of ignore the fact that they're going over to see mm -hmm. amazing Europe, they're just being sick over the side. <coughs> but there's the ones that are kind of really, they really build themselves up, you know, uh, and th this, is, this is the thing that I've been looking forward to. I know it's only a two hour crossing, but you get it, do, do people record in diaries what the crossing is like, mm. with, a, with a tangible sense of, I don't know, like that. Very much so. I mean, the Caroline Lib Powers, I don't know if I've pronounced that right, Emma, but her one is delight. I think they have a very easy crossing one way, and they're absolutely delighted by everything you see. I mean, generally it's just delights, there's not much to say. But the thing is, it's whether you also you take your own carriage with you. So if you take your carriage, they have to take the wheels off and ship the horses. Um, but everyone seems to do it fairly effortlessly and routinely. I was amazed by how much toing and froing there is. Um, but I think there is an excitement, and I think it may, you know, persists that idea that we're actually going to. I think probably we all have it in us. Going across to an island, the journey is very much part of it. Um, yes, and you do get some, you know, people do record dreadful conditions, but it's a fairly easy one with the solar because you're fairly protected. So I don't get the dramatic seasick. Um, I get there's a lovely Jane Carlyle one much later where she travels across with the aged um, John Carlyle's father. Um, the editor of the Times, so Mr. Sterling. Um, sorry, not John Carlyle, John Sterling's father. Um, the whole trip is a disaster. They start from London and he's penny pinching and they travel in some awfully naff way. And there's a thick fog all the way over, so that's no fun. And then he insists on staying somewhere economical where she gets bed bugs. So I'm also compiling things of bad <coughs> trips to the Isle of Wight, because um, <laughs> it seems very clear. And bad accommodation. I mean, I say this is for a trade book, so you'll forgive it all being rather flippant, but Fielding, um, sorry, have I got that right? Yes. Fielding's last journey to Lisbon in search of health is they are forced to stay on the Isle of Wight because of wind, poor winds. And they stay at a sort of dreadful in or in ride waiting and he has very funny people always enjoyed this account of the dreadful landlady and the sort of the paltry kind of provisions that were made um and by that stage he's i hope i've got all this right and it is fielding not smaller yes to lisbon isn't it where he's very where he's he's terribly i mean he's overweight and they have to carry him poor people have to carry him ashore in a chair um but i said there are an awful lot of bad travel stories which are very pleasing really i think yes there's more to be said um so, uh, but almost everybody, as I was saying to people, but sort of ever suffer, almost everybody you know went to the Isle of Wight, and I've got to stop my book just being, and Keats went to the Isle of Wight, and Carlyle. But oddly, you know, Karl Marx had two seaside holidays in Ride. I mean, it does seem quite extraordinary he was there. And what I'm quite interested in is... Um, and it was when Will and Greg once did a talk at UCL about coteries and how things overlapped. And the fact that Gerard Manny Hopkins is sketching in Freshwater Bay in, 17, in 1863 when Tennyson is up the road, but I don't think they actually met. But Hopkins is fond of the Isle of Wight. W.H. Auden, fond of the Isle of Wight. I mean, there is really no end to this. Um, I mean, everyone knows the Tennyson stuff and the, the 19th century, but I'm just rather intrigued by... Um, I mean, the other, just to speak anecdotally, I started off with looking at Defoe's tour of Britain. 
and the detail about the Anwar is very perfunctory, which made you think he probably didn't go there, but just <coughs> kind of, you know, was dialed in a response. And then I was looking through Echo of different editions and thought, no, this is good. It gets much more kind of meaty, and this proves a whole lot. Um, because in 1724, his description of Bath includes, it's so crowded, and this is early days, you're all conversing within the stink of your own excrement. And then when I'm looking at a later edition, and he's gone to Southampton, it's all incredibly polite. And, and of course, you realize, it's not Field, it's not... Um, it's not Defoe anymore. And I was thinking, oh, it's Defoe going to Southampton, and he's kind of polished up his act, and he says more about the Isle of Wight. But it was when there was suddenly a little clue that said, and the, one of the needle rocks fell down two years ago. Thought, oh, right, that is now the 1760s, and Defoe's long since dead. And the only thing I could find, because it keeps being published under his name, is that Richardson actually takes over in the same year as he publishes Clarissa, and Richardson sends Clarissa to the Isle of Wight for a week. I have nothing more to say on it than that, but I was just kind of curious. I don't think, I mean, on the island, they all say Defoe stay there, but I don't think he did because it's so perfunctory about, people just go to, I, the tiresome descriptions where you go to Carisbrook Castle and you see the donkeys around the well and you drop a pin down and it's ages before you hear it. You just get that repeated over and over again. I know, because I was taken as a teenager and it wasn't that exciting, really. Um, but yes, it was a, a long since a tourist destination. Um, I was, this isn't really a question, it's just a comment. It, it's simply to say that, so I think what you've shown this morning is, is the value of the archivist over the computer index. Because <laughs> and unless every word is indexed, and mm. even then you're not going to get the, the, the he's and the she's indexed mm. as to who they are. Yeah. But uh, if you're thinking of visiting an archive, talk to the archivist, and they will know, what mm. they from years of experience, but the, the ways you can go sideways as well as yes. those names. Yes, it is. It is knowing. I mean, there's, you can sort of do it for yourself in a way as well. But it's having, you, it's you in a way would like to come to an archive and just have it sort of open to you, wouldn't you? And, and given being given clues rather than have to go back to first principles. And I think that's probably what we can do. Yeah. And we, you know, some of us have been there longer than others, so some of us will have more knowledge than others, and that's, you know. Um, there's a chance somebody might have asked that question before. Um, there is a chance that people will have asked questions before, but often researchers come with something quite original and new, and so you have to sort of, hmm, that's an interesting one, how are we going to look at that? Sarah, can I ask, because when yes. you said about baptism being recorded, yeah. what I found simply using the Lefay chronology mm. was quite often you get a date registered for a baptism of a, somebody, mm. and then later a christening all the other way up. So the terms that I thought were synonymous, I thought you just had one shot at it. Well, Do you they, understand the difference well, between a I, private I need one to read up on that, because you get a private baptism, and I thought that was where there was a concern about the health of the child. It was a sort of yes, you did done a yes. home job, and so she, mm. that is what happened in Jane's case. And then she was brought into the church mm. a few months later. And that's, that was my assumption, but... Um, you know, there are often questions from the floor that, where I don't know the, the detail and the legal stuff, and there are often books that can sort of fill you in on, on church mm. law or whatever, which would tell you. And that, what I would do now is go back and think, damn, I should have read up on private baptism. Don't worry, sorry, <laughs> I was going to throw that at you. I was just puzzled. Yes, because no, I think yeah, it it's it's one is it throws into that, you know, yeah. when you have a baptism already, you thought mm. that was more or less close yes. to the birth. I mean, one, one of the wonderful ones you get is buried in woolen, and, oh. and you get. and, and, and mm people don't know what it is that you have an affidavit to be and you have to have a sworn statement um, mm. that the body has been buried in wool and this is from introduced from the late 17th century and it was to encourage the wool trade and um, but sometimes parish clerks don't know what an affidavit is and you get it written as an after David or a, <laughs> oh, or affidavit and, and there are all these different spellings of affidavit so um, that often puzzles people when they come to register for Earth, is this about? But it, it was this sort of very um, protectionist thing about encourage, encouraging the English wool trade. You needed to have your body wrapped in woolen, and you had to have a sworn statement that this, is, this has happened. And following the um, critical failure of John Dyer's poem, The Police, I think Dr Johnson said he would be buried in woolen, oh. because his poem was about the wool trade and oh, the police indeed. and everything, and it had come upon... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke nobody gets anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I will now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point at which to finish. Thank you, Sarah and Jane again. Thank you.